Welcome to Vanadium. This is Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. The story of how the ionized form of fluorine, fluoride, made its way into the world's drinking water is an example of the 20th century's romance with chemicals. Better living through chemistry started with DuPont, but still defines our modern era. The introduction of fluoride demonstrates society's burgeoning love affair with the brain children of chemists in the laboratory. The turn of the century brought chemicals that had never existed on planet Earth, and many of these new materials and creations reshaped lifestyles, cultures, and human life itself across the entire planet. The fluoride era officially started in 1945, the same year the first atom bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. So just how did a highly toxic chemical element become part of the diet for most Americans and other people across the developed world? Doctors and scientists in the early 1900s were over the moon about the potential of a newly isolated chemical element to put a stop to cavities and tooth decay. They were so confident that they implemented the addition of fluoride to drinking water at massive scale and recommended it to everyone, including pregnant women and infants. So were they right about fluoride? If this stuff is magic, how does fluoride actually work on the teeth? Other important questions come up. Even if it is good for teeth, is it dangerous to add this directly to the drinking water? Should we be doing this? All very good questions that I'll do my best to answer. So many discoveries start out as puzzles. Fluoride's public health story started in 1901 in Colorado when dozens of people started showing up with strange dark chocolate brown stains on their teeth. Dentists at the time didn't know what to make of the permanent discolorations and what made things even stranger is the people who had the brown stains seemed immune to tooth decay. The people in Colorado Springs in 1901, even those with the stains, seemed to have far better dental health than anyone else in the country. Out west at the time, that really stood out. Dentist Dr. Frederick McKay had just arrived to Colorado Springs from the East Coast to open a dental practice. He's the one who started to put together the clues of the mystery. McKay found no mention of the brown stained teeth in any of the dental literature of the day. The locals blamed the problem on a number of strange factors, including eating too much pork, consuming inferior milk, drinking calcium rich water, and of course, the devil. They weren't much help for the investigation. His efforts were also impaired by a lack of interest among most area dentists. It's a good thing McKay persevered and managed to put together a small team of people dedicated to identifying the cause. The mystery stains came to be known as Colorado Brown Stain. He and his team started to figure it out and began to point the finger at a disease called fluorosis, which is caused by high levels of fluorine or fluoride in the body. Fluorine in the form of a fluoride ion can be detected in at least a few parts per million in any natural water source on Earth. It's widely distributed throughout the environment, occurring in the air, the soil, the minerals, and the water. In some places, the levels can get much higher due to fluoride minerals in the area. In the ocean, the level is fairly low at about one part per million fluoride. This is equivalent to a few milligrams per liter of water. Some areas of Africa and Pakistan have natural water sources with up to six parts per million. In Colorado Springs, the levels were measured at almost 14 parts per million. The levels were so high, the excessive fluoride was causing discoloration and other problems in addition to hardening teeth. Further studies by researchers on water samples in areas of Idaho and Arkansas in 1931 confirmed the link between mottled enamel and high water fluoride levels. Discovered by Henri Masson in 1886, fluorine is a corrosive, pale yellow gas. It's highly reactive, participating in chemical reactions with virtually all organic and inorganic substances. As a result, fluorine is usually found in the environment as fluoride compounds. 
Fluoride is the ion form of fluorine, charged with an electron, reactive, and easily dissolvable in protic solvents like water. Fluorine remained just a laboratory curiosity until 1940, when nuclear energy requirements stimulated commercial production. In industrial settings, fluorine and its compounds are used in producing uranium, plastics, ceramics, pesticides, and pharmaceuticals. The medicinal use of fluoride for the prevention of tooth decay officially began in January 1945, when the community water supplies in Grand Rapids, Michigan were fluoridated to a level of one part per million. This practice quickly spread across the country and eventually the world. The types of fluoride added to different water systems include fluorosilicic acid, sodium fluorosilicate, and sodium fluoride. So how does fluoride strengthen the surface of the teeth? It starts with the tooth itself, what it's made of, a ceramic material produced naturally by the body called hydroxyapatite. This is the same mineral found in the bones. Hydroxyapatite is a hard, strong, but somewhat brittle ceramic composed of crystals of calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and oxygen. Normally, tooth and bone don't contain any fluorine or fluoride, but the crystal loves the stuff when it's there. Fluoride interacts with hydroxyapatite to form fluoroapatite, which is less susceptible to erosion by acid-producing oral bacteria. This stuff, formed on the surface of hydroxyapatite, is a harder, and under some conditions, a more wear-resistant material. So, when everything works right, the fluoride chemically reacts with tooth enamel and creates an even stronger fluoroapatite ceramic in its place. After the introduction of fluoride to the water supply, there was a reduction in tooth decay. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention named community water fluoridation one of the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century. However, the implementation was accompanied by fluoride finding its way into all kinds of other products. Countries that didn't add fluoride to their water also observed big drops in the rate of cavities. It's possible, and perhaps likely, that fluoride in the toothpastes and mouthwashes achieved the same effect without widespread addition to the water supply and ingestion. The only demonstrated positive impact of fluoride on human health is the prevention of cavities. No one has ever demonstrated any other way that fluoride could be good for you. No fluoride deficiency has ever been documented for humans. It's now widely accepted that fluoride only helps prevent dental decay by topical means, by direct application to the tooth enamel itself. Drinking fluoride is an inefficient method of delivery. No surprise. Too much fluoride in tooth and bone results in fluorosis. The high levels paradoxically weaken the structure of hydroxyapatite, leading to worse tooth decay, brittle bones, and skeletal disease. After the U.S. implemented water fluoridation, it gained acceptance by the World Health Organization as an effective oral health intervention. At least 30 other nations instituted similar water policies. However, in recent years, a number of countries including Sweden, the Netherlands, Germany, and Switzerland stopped adding fluoride to their water supplies due to concerns about safety and effectiveness. Around the world, the view of fluoride is changing. Currently, only about 5% of the world's population, around 350 million people in the US, Australia, Malaysia, New Zealand, Singapore, and Ireland consume artificially fluoridated water globally. The safety concerns about fluoride came as a result of a few well-accepted large-scale research investigations. In a meta-analysis of 27 studies on fluoride and neurotoxicity, researchers from the School of Public Health at Harvard University and China Medical University in Shenyang found strong indications that fluoride may adversely affect cognitive development in children. Other studies have shown impact of ingested fluoride on the thyroid gland. In a 2005 study, it was found that 47% of children living in a New Delhi neighborhood with an average water fluoride level over 4 ppm 
showed clinical hypothyroidism attributed to fluoride. It's also a known enzyme disruptor. Fluoride's anti-cavity effect is derived in part from its ability to derange the enzymes of karyogenic bacteria. It interferes by attaching itself to metal ions at an enzyme's active site the same way it does to calcium in the tooth and bone. This makes me wonder what else fluorine is doing inside the cellular machinery. If you want fluoride filtered out of the water, it's not easy since the atom is so small, but it can be removed by distillation and reverse osmosis. Over the past two decades, many communities in Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand have stopped adding fluoride to their water supplies. In Israel, the Minister for Health announced in April 2013 the end of mandatory water fluoridation. The fluoride debate really shows the dynamics of science and power. Until recently, the dominant narrative has been that water fluoridation is absolutely safe and effective, with advocates claiming perfect scientific endorsement and support. In reality, fluoride does strengthen tooth enamel, but the full story is more complicated. There is likely a better way than adding tons of fluorine-based chemicals directly to the drinking water for ingestion. Probably fluoride toothpaste or mouthwash is a better idea. Thank you very much. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium.